Well, on the undercard of Ryan Garcia versus Luke Campbell, we're going to be seeing super middleweight unified champion Fran Chung Cruz return to action. This will be her first fight since the controversy of the Alejandra Jimenez match earlier in 2020. Beginning of the year. She is going to be facing a, a, a journeyman level opponent, pedestrian level opponent, and Alicia Curry, kind of opponent who's got an upside down record. Oh. Opponent that took a loss to Savannah Marshall, took a loss to Raquel Miller, took a loss to Kali Reese, took a loss to Marie Eve DeCare. He's wall at different weights. Anywhere from the welterweight division to the super middleweight division. She took a loss, two losses actually, to the current reigning IBF champion at 140 pounds, Mary McGee. And the loss to Alexandria Lopez. That being said, and those things in mind, yes, this is a lighter touch. This is a pedestrian level opponent. I chalk it up to a COVID fight. We've seen no shortage of these COVID kind of fights. COVID kind of opponents. I mean, look at the guy that Christina Hammer just fought. What was she, like 44, 45 years old? Amanda Serrano fought Diana Santana for a second time. Essentially what I'm getting at is this isn't the only fight like this that we've seen in these COVID times. I mean, you know, Sinicia Estrada versus Miranda Atkins. That's yet another example. In these COVID times, you know, it's it's hard to get the big fights with, with, with the big name fighters and, and, and make the kind of matches that make sense given where a fighter is in their career. So, you know, just with that in mind. Believe it or not, I'm not critical. I'm not critical because the last time Franchon Cruz got to see any action was in January of last year. That controversy with, with Alejandra Jimenez. Franchon hasn't fought in 12 months. And Franchon campaigns as a super middleweight, reigns as a super middleweight champion. I often talk to you guys about the state of the super middleweight division that, you know, this is bigger than just Franchon and, and bigger than any given champion at that weight. At 168 pounds, there aren't that many girls to choose from, so you work with what you've got. I said it before and I'll say it again. When the next Olympic Games take place, and, 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 and those amateurs that are competing in those games, and, and just amateurs overall, once those amateurs decide to go pro, divisions like the super middleweight division, the middleweight division, the junior middleweight division, these divisions will be more populated than they are now. But here and now, there is a scarcity of opponents. There's a scarcity of girls to choose from. So a fighter like Franchon, who needs a tune-up fight, who needs a keep-busy fight, thank God but so much to choose from, enter Alicia Curry, a pedestrian-level opponent, yes, a, a, an opponent that has an upside down record, but you know, that's what's there for the time being. That's what's there until you can shake off the cobwebs and make a better fight, like a unification match with the unbeaten Aline Cedar Roots, the only other unified champion at this weight. And I look at this, I look at this keep busy fight, this tune up fight, as a prelude to something bigger, to something better. I won't hold that against Franchon. How could I? How could I hold the state of the weight class against one particular fighter? What, what's Franchon supposed to do in that situation? I reiterate, 168, 160, and 154. They're not as deep as the lower weights. I think 2021 is going to be a good year for Franchon. I think that not only will Franchon get the opportunity to perhaps become an undisputed champion at this weight, but I also happen to think that there's at least one other really good fight that she can have in the near future, and that is the Christina Hammer fight, who I mentioned earlier. Christina Hammer was in action very recently against Sana Taruni, and that was supposed to be a, a WBC interim fight. It just so happens Franchon is the WBC's full-fledged champion. Essentially what I'm getting at is Christina Hammer is the mandatory challenger for Franchon Cruz's world title. One of them. That's a good fucking fight. A fight we might get to see later on in the year. One of two. We might get to see that Christina Hammer fight. We might get to see that that Aline Cedar Ruse unification match for all the marbles that will effectively establish the lineage of this era's super middleweight division as the winner of that fight would effectively become that division's undisputed and lineal champion. It all comes down to Franchon and Aline, and I think that's a fight that can and will happen this year. But right away, Franchon's got to shake off the cobwebs. She's got to shake off the ring rust, and she's going to be doing that. The undercard of Garcia versus Campbell moving into 2021, perhaps capping off the year I expect to see that fight. But fight, she's got to make it past Ashley Kerr. And, you know, I think Franchon will. I think she's got all the ingredients to make it past what, in many ways, is just a formality fight. A fight intended to, to ease Franchon back into activity so that they can set up bigger and better fights 
going into 2021. So best wishes to Franchon, and hopefully we'll see her against someone more formidable than Ashley, provided she makes it past Ashley. And, and I think she will. Uh, I think she will. Another news I'm sure most of you might have heard by now, per tweet from Michael Benson, Canelo Alvarez has vacated his WBA middleweight title after winning the WBA and WBC super middleweight titles against Callum Smith. As things stand, Ryota Murata has the WBA regular middleweight belt, and Chris Eubank Jr. has the WBA interim middleweight belt. This creates two separate scenarios, perhaps even three. One must understand that, you know, Ryota Murata didn't just come into procuring that WBA regular title. He's had it for some time, and because he's had it for some time, it's only right that Ryota Murata be elevated to WBA super champion in the middleweight division. That if anybody's going to get that opportunity, that designation, if it makes sense for anyone to hold the full version... That is if the WBA keeps the super title in circulation. If that title is going to anyone, it should go to Ryota Murata. Though I reiterate, this turn of events does create two separate scenarios. It's conceivable that Ryota Murata could be elevated to super champion. That's one scenario, that Ryota gets elevated to super, and Chris Eubank Jr., the current interim champion, that he might get elevated to regular. It could happen that way, and if it did, that would make the most sense. A, a, a separate scenario exists to where, I don't know, you know, maybe they order a fight between Ryota Murata and Chris Eubank Jr. for the newly vacated WBA super title. I, I like the idea of... of that kind of a fight. I think that a fight between Ryota Murata and Chris Eubank Jr. makes for complete fireworks. Both of these guys are punchers. Both of these guys, they are action guys. You know how likely this scenario is, but it is something that, you know, could happen. It's, it's possible. I just don't know how probable it is. A third scenario exists that I'm really not a fan of, and it is what took place in the 130-pound division over a year ago. That, you know, there was a time when Alberto Machado was holding the WBA's regular title. And Alberto Machado had beat Jezreel Corrales, the reigning WBA super champion. But he did not receive the quote-unquote super version of the title. Several months later, after Alberto had already beat Jezreel Corrales, the super title was made available to Gervonta Davis. And this is inexplicable because this was well after Alberto had already beat Jezreel. Jezreel had lost the title on the scales, you understand. He blew the weight. So the title became vacant. And, and one assumed that, well, all that means is that the only one that can win the title is Alberto, who did make the weight and did win the fight. And, and for a time, it looked like he was the only reigning WBA super champion. Several months later, the super title, the vacant super title, was made available to Gervonta Davis, who fought Jesus Cuellar for it. That is a scenario here that could happen, though I hope it doesn't. I hope that what does happen is that Ryota Murata is elevated to full champion because it's only right. It makes sense. But we'll see. This also communicates a few other things about the future of Canelo Alvarez. You know, very recently, Eddie Reynoso talked about how the only guy who they would come down and wait to fight, the only guy they'd do this for is Errol Spence Jr. That's the only guy... They'd come back to middleweight for. And initially, that might come off as, as, as mixed signals, mixed messages from the Canelo people, because at the same time, simultaneously, the Canelo people are letting it be known that... They're going to be campaigning in the super middleweight division from here on out for the foreseeable future. That being said, when you hear what's being said about where Canelo's going to be, and, and you hear what Eddie's got to say about a potential return to the middleweight division, one is left to wonder, well, 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 what should we expect to happen? Well, think about it this way. You know, Canelo's no longer a champion in the middleweight division. He's a unified champion in the super middleweight division. An Errol Spence Jr. fight is not a fight that is about to happen. We know what Canelo Alvarez is set to do for at least the next two fights. We do. Abney yielded him and a subsequent Billy Joe Saunders unification match. Beyond that, you know, after all of that takes place, provided that Canelo Alvarez is still in the winner's bracket, I can't see him returning to the middleweight division for Errol Spence Jr. at that point because at that point, well... Unless Errol wins a title there in, in, in the next couple of months, that would be a non-title fight. 
That's what that would be. So what you have to ask yourself is, do you think that in the next five or six months, Errol Spence Jr. is going to hopscotch from 147 past 154 all the way up to 160? You think that's what he's going to do? Does that seem likely to you? And even if it does, even if this seems plausible to you in some way, shape, or form, do you think Canelo Alvarez thereafter is going to come down and wait to fight Errol Spence Jr. in what would be a non-title fight? Because all the titles in the in the middleweight division, they are spoken for. Demetrius Andre holds the WBO. Ryota Murata holds the WBA. Jermall Charlo holds the WBC. And Gennady Golovkin holds the IBF. Which one of those guys are you banking on Errol Spence Jr. to win a world title from? Oh, which one of those fights stands the best chance of even being made? Not a single one! From where I'm sitting, that being said, the Canelo Alvarez versus Errol Spence Jr. fight is now where I always thought it was, where I said it was before. Nowhere. That's not a fight that I think happens in the near future. That's not a fight that I think comes to pass at all. Yeah, I don't think that's ever going to happen. I never did. And I hardly think that Canelo Alvarez is going to put his super middleweight campaign on hold to potentially fight Errol Spence Jr. at 160 for no world title at all. Like I always told you, that shit ain't going to happen. In other news per tweet from Mike Kopinger a few days ago, sources Robert Helenius and Adam Kovnowski are slated to meet in a heavyweight rematch in the first quarter of 2021. Helenius shocked Kovnowski via a fourth round TKO in March. Now, Kovnowski will have a shot to avenge his loan pro defeat. PBC fights, so either Showtime or Fox. What network will air the card is currently undecided. Uh, maybe it'll be Fox. You know, maybe they want to get a lot of eyes for that thing. I-, I don't know. Doesn't really matter. It's all the same. And, you know, I'm thinking about this fight. And, and I-, I have to admit that I am intrigued. I have to admit that I am going to take time out to watch this match because... I don't know what Adam can really change. You gotta understand something about Adam. Adam's bread and butter has always been his activity, his work rate. The fact that he's a he's a heavyweight, a full-fledged heavyweight that goes out there and and he throws a lot of punches. And and yeah, that's that's gonna win you sight and fights with sight and fighters. But that's the kind of thing to where it works until it doesn't. Shit ain't gonna fly with everybody. There are virtues to being the characteristically busy a fighter. There are virtues to being a volume guy. But I reiterate, that's one of those things in the sport of boxing that wakes up until it doesn't. And once it stops waking, what are you gonna do? Do you have it in you to change? Do you have it in you to, to, to be something more, something else? Because against this guy, that's what costed you the last time. Standing in front of him too much and opening up. You got caught between the punches. Your base style backfired on you. It happens. You know, what might work with one guy may not work with another. And and when you're in that situation, what do you do? Because short of something being wrong with the other guy, short of Robert Hellenius walking in there with some kind of handicap, some kind of issue, some kind of something, you know, I, I just don't know what Adam can do differently in, in this situation. In, in other words, does he win the rematch? Does he avenge the loss? Because Adam, Adam's not a one hit a quitter guy. He, he doesn't pack that kind of punch. He, he doesn't pack that kind of power to where he's, he's just got to chin the guy one good time and that might be enough. Adam beats guys by way of volume, overwhelming them with a barrage of punches. But a barrage of punches against Robert Hellenius, well, that's what costed you. So what are you going to do? Be more economic with this guy? What are you going to do? What are you going to do differently? I can't in good conscience tell you that Adam does or doesn't win the rematch. And that's what makes it intriguing. That's why I I, I am going to be tuning in to see what happens here. Because I'm going to tell you something. Adam wasn't supposed to lose this fight. I mean, he wasn't. He wasn't. He was an unbeaten contender, 20 professional victories, no losses against Robert Hellenius, who had been stopped by Johan Duwapis, had been stopped by Gerald Washington, dropped a decision to Dillian White. Adam wasn't supposed to lose to this guy, but he did. And it looks a lot like it was Adam's base style that betrayed him. You know, in the heavyweight division, punch resistance, having a chin, it's a rather contentious subject. More contentious than, you know, any other weight class because in the heavyweight division, unlike most other divisions, you're always one punch away from being knocked out. Men that size catching you with a clean shot 
I mean, you're talking about guys that are 200 plus pounds, you understand? That, that's what you're talking about. And in the division where the guys have that kind of size and, 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 and that's what's behind the punch, you really are always just one punch away from being knocked out. It's a rather contentious subject in the heavyweight division, punch resistance. But I do think that Adam being stopped the way that he was stopped by Robert Hellenius, it does call his durability into question as, as to, you know, what can he take? What can he sustain? I mean, you got stopped by Hellenius. I'll tell you, you know, Joe Washington's not a big puncher, but he managed to stop this guy. You know, the Johan Duapis knockout, that, that's one thing. But being stopped by Gerald Washington, you know, Gerald stopped this guy where Adam was stopped by this guy. Man, he wasn't supposed to lose to Hellenius. Adam beat Charles Martin, former IBF champion Charles Martin. He stopped Gerald Washington. So he could go on from that and get stopped by Robert Hellenius? No, no, he wasn't supposed to lose that fight. It's, it's a situation where Adam stopped the guy that stopped the guy that stopped Adam. That stopped him. Adam beat Gerald, and Gerald beat Robert, and Robert beat Adam. He was supposed to fucking lose that fight. He wasn't supposed to lose to that guy. But he did. And in hindsight, it almost seems like a red flag that Adam Kovnowski put on the performance that he did against Chris Ariola. That, that was before the Robert Hellenius fight. That those guys, they were going balls to the wall. They were throwing all kinds of punches. And, and I guess it should have been interpreted as a red flag that, you know, rather than stopping Chris Ariola, who is so obviously a journeyman at this point. You went balls to the wall with that guy. You go balls to the wall with Chris Ariola? You get stopped? By Robert Hellenius? What the fuck is going on? So yeah, the rematch has sizzle. The rematch between them, it has genuine intrigue.